Um, morning, everyone. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, uh, thank you to those online and, and those in person who are joining us today. Uh, my name is Lengo Khatebe. I'm a civil society and youth engagement officer at WWF. Uh, today's webinar, um, we will be discussing two important documents that were, were written by youth and, and a, a women's group in Carolina, uh, Womanda. Um, today's webinar is a collaboration between the Youth Climate Champions Program, the South African Research Watch, as well as uh, Womanda. Today's webinar will facilitate a discussion around youth position paper and tackle it in, in exploring meaningful youth engagement in South, Af South African climate policy and the Women's Manifesto. The conversation will focus on the youth position paper and the manifesto's cause to climate action and how policymakers can create a fertile ground for youth and women's climate action. With our panelists, we aim to facilitate a lively discussion and challenge the ambition of youth and women's involvement in climate policy through suggested actions from both groups. The Youth Climate Champions Program aims to empower youth to engage strongly with climate action and climate policy processes. The program falls under the Climate Ambition to Accountability Project, which is a partnership between WWF South Africa, the Cl uh, climate, action South Afri climate Action Network South Africa, as well as the Inst Institute of Economic Justice. The project is co-funded by the European Union and the Swedish International Development Agency. Southern Africa Resource Watch is an independent non-profit organization that monitors corporate and government and government's conduct in the extraction of natural resources in Southern Africa. As part of its work, South Southern Africa Resource Watch assesses the extent to which these activities uplift the economic conditions of the Sadiq region's um, communities. So today, uh, the reason why we are hosting this webinar is that the impacts of climate change in South Africa vary across different groups, influenced by, um, influenced by factors such as age, class, and gender. Women and youth have been identified as particularly vulnerable with women facing additional burdens due to their social constructed roles in family and community, community care, and youth bearing the brunt of climate crisis. While efforts have been made to in incorporate the voices of youth and women in, in policy, there remains an urgent need for additional initiatives and platforms that ensure the substantial participation. Prioritizing inclusive and continuous engagement with the vulnerable and marginalized stakeholders is a crucial for policymakers to gain enhanced insights, make informed decisions, and effectively mitigate impacts of climate change for the benefit of all. With the contest, with, within this contest, the Youth Climate Champions recently published the position paper titled Exploring Meaningful Youth Engagement in, Southern, in South African Climate Policy. This paper critically examines the validity of youth engagement in policy and provides actionable recommendations to deepen these engagements. Additionally, the Women's Manifesto from Omanda Community Development NPC amplifies the discourse by shedding light on the specific concerns and demands of women in relation to climate change. Their pioneering report led by the women of Carolina not only documents the effects of climate change and, and coal mining operations in their community, but also emphasizes the disproportionate impact on women, youth, and vulnerable groups. Collectively, these documents underscore the importance of comprehensive and inclusive approaches to climate policy, taking into account vulnerabilities and experiences of both youth and women. By doing so, we can work towards a sustainable and equitable future. So thank you so much again for joining us. We will start um, by hearing from the youth and women about their, about their papers. Uh, and then after that, we'll have a panel discussion. So to start up, we'll have Kaisha Mukwato, who will talk about the youth position paper. Okay, um, good morning, everybody. 
Okay, I'm going to have to repeat that. You know, it's always difficult being the first speaker for the day because it's like when a plane takes off and everyone is still in their zone and looking. And so or what should I say? Top of the morning, everyone. Are we all here? Okay, great. So my name is Kaisha Mokwato and I'll be presenting the calls to action that young people have gathered and compiled for you. Uh, they've also been featured in our position paper, which we published last month on the on in, in commemoration of June 16. Um, the position paper is titled Exploring Meaningful Youth Engagement in South African Climate Policy. So as I said, this is, if, this is from our position paper. So there is no way that I can come here and talk about the position paper without speaking about the brains and the organizations that have gone beyond um, behind making sure that this paper becomes a success. For example, the Climate Ambition to Accountability Project, which is our publisher, our lead authors from the YCC, from the Youth Climate Championships cohort of 2022, and your, we have our editors, our project lead, uh, the reviewer, and the special mention of the contributions which were made by our workshop participants. So allow me to give an overview of the position paper before dwelling much into what the calls to action are for the fellow young people. So the overview is as follows. So the paper was led by the Youth Climate Championships from the Project Climate Ambition to Accountability Project, which aimed at enabling young people to participate in climate policy ambition in implementation and accountability. So as I said, that we have a number of young people who are part of this program. So the position paper acts as a platform that seeks to capacitate, to support and to facilitate collaborations amongst the youth and youth youth organizations in South Africa addressing climate change. For us in our project, it was um, the different organization, the South African Climate Action Network, the Institute of Economic Justice, and the WWF. So the paper also recognizes the previous efforts that have been made to involve the youth in climate policy making and even highlighted the importance of this involvement. Because truly speaking, there is no way that we cannot speak about youth involvement into what affects them or might affect them in the near future. So the paper provided a clarity on overcoming challenges that hinder youth engagement and how an inclusive approach in decision making can be employed, considering the needs of the diverse population in South Africa, including youth. So we all come back, we all come from different backgrounds, obviously, from different um, environments, we face different challenges, but how can we together now come and say these are the solutions that can be used for each group moving forward. And then the last um, lead is that the primary objective of the position paper is to continue a conversation on the idea of prioritizing youth engagement in climate policy processes, as well as empowering young people to play a significant role in shaping the planet's future. So now allow me to move to the calls to action that where that the series of calls to actions to our policymakers. Thank you. Where are our where are our policymakers? Because we said we'll be having a conversation with them today. So okay, okay, they should be visible. We should see them because we should really have this conversation today. So the calls to actions, the first call is the capacity strengthening. This is the policymakers are encouraged to invest in strengthening the capacity of youth to participate in climate policy processes actively. This involves providing training, education, and resources to enhance their understanding and skills. Because truly speaking, you need to be strengthened into knowing how to move further. For you to move, you need to be knowledgeable and be having some, and also through forms such as training, education, and the provision of resources, then you can ensure that you move, you know, with a meaningful impact. The second call is establishing youth councils. This is establishing dedicated youth councils is recommended to provide a platform for young people to voice their opinions, their ideas, 
and concerns regarding climate policy. These councils can serve as important avenue for youth representation and decision making. I'm sure we can all vouch for this one because we really do need tables where young people are able to gather to bring about their ideas and their innovations you know, towards uh, climate action. And then the third call is empowering youth for climate action. Policymakers are asked to empower youth by providing them with necessary support, resources, and opportunities to be able to take meaningful action on climate change. This includes fostering partnership, uh, this includes fostering entrepreneurship, innovation, and collaboration among young people. It is very important as young that as young people we be empowered so that we know how to actually uh, uh, so that we know how to actually put action into what we are proposing. So it is very important it is very important that the young people are empowered meaningfully so that they're able to take meaningful action. And then our fourth call is empowering youth in South Africa to participate in global climate policy for national impact. This, the importance of enabling youth in South Africa to engage with global climate policy initiatives is emphasized. By empowering them to contribute on the international stage, their actions can significantly impact national climate policy outcomes. This is giving the young people a best view that they can use in order to impact their different locations. And then the last call to action is empowering youth in South Africa to lead in climate policy, monitoring, evaluation, and collaboration. This call to action highlighted the need to involve youth in the monitoring, in evaluating, and collaboration on climate policy initiatives. By actively applying young people to these processes, their perspectives and expertise can contribute to more effective and accountable climate policies. So it is very important that young people are not only involved into decision making at your bottom or at your local level, but they're able to impact nationally and globally if possible. So I finish off my presentation with an invitation to everyone. This is an invitation for you to go onto the South African um, Climate Action Network to download the paper as published and allow yourself to learn through the paper and go forth to share the paper with other people. Why do I say share the paper? Because I believe that a candle loses nothing of its own by lighting another. Instead, we make the globe more in light. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Kaisha. Uh, next up is Wangagile, who will share the, the Women's Manifesto's course. One, two. Yeah, uh, I hope you could all see me. I'm a bit disadvantaged, but I hope you can you can all see me. Uh Sanmonani, good morning. Hello, hi. Um Ibo Sanmonani. Thank you. There we go. Um, um thank you very much for the presentation. It was very insightful. I, I enjoyed it. Um, so I am Ubongile Ngagazwane. I come from an organization called Woman Community Development. Together with um, Sarah, we have worked on a project called Women on Coal. And this was a research 
based on how women are affected in mining affected communities. Um, just to highlight, before we've done this research, we were trained by Sarah on different kinds of tools that allowed us to get informative, um, that allows us to get information that um, made us understand that climate change does not only um, affect us on a lighter note, but on a greater scale. So I'm here today not to talk about the research mainly, but to talk about um, the manifesto, which is um, the demands in simple terms as comrades, uh, the demands that we as women in Carolina want. Sisong, are we together? All right. So one of those demands, it is on local governance. We as women of Carolina, we want information sharing solutions on the just, on the just transition. We have been having conversation on the just transition, but this conversation are not clear enough on how women will benefit from this just transition. We have been having conversation on just transition, but they are not clear enough on whether women will get what they need, will get what they want. As we speak today, we have a high number of women who are affected by climate change. Are we together? We move. And also, as women of Carolina, coming from a mining affected uh, community with 12 mines, we want transparency on how these mining companies are going to, okay. Let me breathe. You guys are so quiet. You're making me nervous. Um, as women of Carolina, we want the government to intervene and to help us make this mining companies account for everything that is happening in our community. Having a discussion about just transition, to us, there are a lot of questions, there are a lot of gaps. We cannot talk about a change if we do not, we cannot talk about a change on a national level if we do not talk about the change or we do not change everything that is happening on a, okay, we do not talk about a change on a national level if we cannot make a change on the local level. So at this point, as the woman, as the woman of Carolina talking about local mining or mining companies that are operating in our spaces and the government having to talk about the just transition, we, we have noted gaps in terms of accountability and transparency. Are we together? Are we in the same bed? We move to civil society and social media. As the woman of Carolina, we feel that social media haven't really told our stories as, it, as they are. I don't know whether it's because of the influence of government. I don't know whether it's because of their own policies or the something that they want to protect. But as the woman of Carolina, we have told our stories throughout this research. And I can say now that if we do present this research to journalists, not all of them will tell it like it is. At this point, we can stand as, as, as women and, and tell you exactly that if I go search for an opportunity, sor and sor, specifically the person will tell me that if I do not get what is between your legs, then we are not going to have this conversation of opportunities. We move. Um, on national government, we want transparency and accountability in, and ensure accountability on climate finance system. This includes giving equal opportunities. As we speak now, uh, apparently we have decisions uh, makers in the house, right? 
but there's just two of them. I'm worried. I'm really worried. Because we as an organization do not only speak of climate change as our problem, but we also speak of gender-based violence as our problem. And if we can link gender-based violence and climate change through this report research, then it means that talking about a just transition without gender-based violence is a waste of time. We move, are we together? Thank you. We call, we demand that the policymakers put climate justice at the heart of climate policy, including establishing legal frameworks that recognize climate vulnerabilities of women, which includes the protection of social media, economic, and cultural vulnerabilities. We come from a community, a patriarchal community. As women of Carolina, we are rooted to who we are as black women. This means that our traditions, cultures, and how we do things come with us wherever we are. And as black women, Speaking about an opportunity as a black woman standing in front of you, I'm already being criticized on how is she going to achieve that. One of the tools that we, we had throughout this research was called the master's house. We called it the master's house, for example, because in every spaces that women are in our society, let me make an example of church. Our mothers go to church every day. If you can rate the gender population in church, mostly a woman. It's women pushing the work there. It's women making us believe that, you know what, there is a God, there is Jesus, there is that, there is that. But who are leading? Who are the leaders? Who are shining? It's women who does the housework, but the end of, at the end of the day, who will make decisions for this household? As we speak, where I'm from, in this 12 months that we're talking about, I can not, I speak this in confidence, not even one woman sit as part of uh, the decision makers or rather as part of um, management in any of these minds. No one. But we do have operating minds that are supposed to benefit us. I'm here to speak about real issues. That is why we have these demands to government. That is why we ask government that as you speak of the just transition, be inclusive of women. And we say, and if we say be inclusive of women, we want to speak about the issues that we face it. Because the problem is you come into our spaces as government, right? As the PCC, and you present to us what you think are possible solutions. But we do not talk about what are the problems that are you facing so that we can come to the possible solutions. So as the woman on call, who are not actually benefiting from this call, we demand that the government be inclusive as possible. We want to be in those spaces of decision-making and not only be in those spaces and talk, but we want implementation as well. We want to be seen as women and we want to be heard 
and we want you as government to make sure that these mining companies comply. And we want to, you as government to make sure that these mining companies are accountable for their actions before we can get to speaking about the just transition. Um, lastly, as women capacitating other women, as women engaging with government, engaging with other organizations, we are not here because uh, we feel like my boyfriend is abusing me. So I need to stay away from home. But we are here because we want change for every other woman that is here in this room. And we can't be here sitting and speaking about the same thing. Next time the PCC comes to Carolina, we want to see changes. Come to us and tell us that we have the budget and we want to implement and we'll start next week. I think that um, I said it very clear and straightforward that we do not, we no, we no longer want to come and discuss about policies, about making the government account. It's it's a really frustrating, but we want to speak of we have already implemented. Where have we gone wrong? What else can we do? As women, what do you think uh, went wrong? Where is the gap? And this demands as to which I can share to the room. They were clear and straightforward. And lastly, we would like the government to take notes that as women working in the spaces, as the youth has um, represented or done a presentation, we need capacity building from you as government because we work the ground. We know what people want. We need the money to do the work. And even the documentation that was presented, if they do not have resources, it will just be on the archives. Can government capacitate us on funding so that we are able to give you the direction of a proper, just transition? That is inclusive for everyone. The work that we do should be seen by government and should be funded by government so that government is able to implement what communities, different kind of communities really need. Uh, I can speak the whole day. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was all from me. Um, thank you to Bongegile and oh, I'm gonna say your name and Kaisha uh, for for uh, sharing the presentations. Um, so I hope that that sort of gives you a context of what we are gonna be discussing today. Um, so in the panel today, uh, while I allow my third speaker to join me on, on stage, uh, we have um, Kaisha Mokwatlo, uh, I apologize, is a legal studies graduate with a major interest in environmental law. Besides academics, she has major love for nature, fresh air, and beautiful sceneries. Kaisha attended the 2022 Youth Climate Champions Program. She's also part of the team that developed and wrote the youth uh, position paper. Wangile Zwane is an activist fighting for the rights of mining affected women. women af She's an activist fighting for the rights of the mining affected community in Carolina and Pomalanga. Wangile advocates for a feminist approach to sustainable women's approach uh, for women's development in communities. She, has, she was a principal researcher for the Southern African Resource Watch Community Study, which resulted in the Women on Call report 
a feminist participatory action research on coal climate change by women in Carolina. Additionally, she is a member of the 2022 Youth Climate Champions Bootcamp, Bootcamp cohort. Uh, Nadia Shah, who's joining us online, is a senior manager um, of, of inclusive action and um, inclusive climate action and mainstreaming at C40. Nadia is supporting seven African cities, um, Accra, Lagos, Addis Ababa, Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, Tswane, and Johannesburg to embed climate change, inclusivity, and equity into their decision-making processes, implementation plans, and operations. And lastly, we have Kwezigaz, Kwezigaz Fund for, I, I think I might have said that uh, wrong, but please join us on the, on the side. Uh, she, uh, she is a municipal and project manager at the Presidential Climate Commission Secretariat, responsible for climate finance and innovation. Kwezigazi provides pro project and, and organizational support to the work of the department, which includes coordination of projects and work programs for the portfolio, management of the outreach, outreach and financial sector partner programs, and the undertaking of research projects for the in-house work in climate finance portfolio. Um, so before we start with our um, or with our panel, I do want to say that uh, C40 provides support to cities. So they're not essentially the policymakers, but they support cities to be able to 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 uh, put together the right policy uh, policies as well. Essentially, as well, I think I, I, I'm gonna. Uh, they're going to correct me because this is our second day of symposium and, and yesterday I was accused of defending the PCC. I'm going to say again today <laughs> that the PCC also are not the policy makers, but they, 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 they advise government on, 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 the pol on the policies around just transition, if, if I am, yeah, I think I'm free correctly, but because you can correct me. Um, so just to get started with our... Um, with our panel. Thank you, uh, Nadia. Thank you, Kwezi, and th thank you, Kasha and Bongekele, for joining us today. Um, so we are had this discussion. You've heard what the, uh, the two, uh, two pre presenters uh, spoke about. So I, uh, I just thought to um, just reflect on what you heard today. And I'll start with you, Bongekele, as to what did you hear from the youth? What did you think about the, what the youth uh, uh, um, proposed in, in their action calls? Uh, what are your thoughts around that? Okay, for me, I think that the the youth is doing a great job in trying to get us as the youth, or rather, to be in spaces of decision making. I like the point of having youth councils. It's important that the youth can gather and talk about issues that are affecting the youth in a context of climate change. I think that as women, as youth, we are all affected, but we see solutions from different point of views. So I think such conversations are important that we have. And I, I hope that we are able to, to implement those spaces and get even other young people who are not here to also be involved in the spaces. Thank you so much. Uh, and Kaisha, what, what, what were your thoughts around what you heard from the women's uh, uh, calls uh, to, to, to action? And then um, I think follow, followed it would be crazy as a reflection on both papers. Or what did you think? And then lastly, we'll have Nadia coming in to, uh, to give her reflections around the both papers as well. Okay, um, I think the Women's Manifesto is a very important, has very important solutions we can look up to. I think women are active people. Women are at the forefront as much as we think they're in the background. Women are doing the most. I see active women in you guys, the Womanja team. I see active women. Amanda women. Amanda. Yeah, so they really have beautiful, um, I love how their manifesto is not only based on what they've heard, but it is what they're experiencing. 
It is what they see each and every day. And I love how they've grouped themselves together because you cannot rise as a woman alone, but you can lift a few. You can gather as a group and make sure that you have something concrete that you're bringing to the women out there. So I love what the women of Carolina are doing. They have a really good, I was telling them yesterday that if they were selling a book, if this was a book, I'd be buying it right now because it doesn't only have the content, but it has the feel within it. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Um, thank you, Tlingiwe. Uh, so my name is Kwezi Van Fall. I am with the PCC Secretariat, as um, Tlingiwe has mentioned. Um, and just my reflections on the speakers and just the papers in general. I think I, I, I speak as youth, I speak as a woman, a black woman at that. And I would also just like to commend um, both the YCC as well as um, the woman of Umandla um, on the incredible work that you guys have done on, on both of these papers. And um, I'm quite impressed and I'm quite impressed to actually see just the dedication of youth um, in the aspect of climate change and what is happening within the country, just the need and the zeal to, you know, be involved um, and to want to be included, I think speaks for itself. And it's very encouraging for us, you know, as the PCC and other um, bodies that work within government, you know, to, to be able to go back and say that the youth is there and the youth is willing the youth wants to be included. And this is something that I'm very happy to sort of like go back and take back to the people or the powers that be. So um, well done to you guys. And Nadia? Thank you, Shingiwe, and good morning, everyone. And thank you so much to YCC and Womandla for the presentations and more importantly, for the work that you're doing on the ground. Um, so, as Shlingiwe said, I'm Nadia, I'm from Sipati City. Sipati is a, a non-profit organization and my role um, is really to support our cities to embed inclusivity and equity um, into everything that they do. Um, and I work um, across Africa. Um, I really want to start off by you know, agreeing that I think we see this time and time again that there are many spaces within the climate change discourse where the voices of women and the voices of youth um, have been and continue to be not only marginalized but trivialized. Um, and I think that the, the challenge of tokenism is, is a serious one. It's really dangerous and we need to be taking it more seriously. It is perpetuating the status quo. Um, it's denying us the, the really valuable insights, the creativity and the leadership that women and youth bring to the table. Um, and as I reflect on these presentations, I think for me working in a nonprofit, but very closely to government, um, I really ask myself two questions. And, and that is what is driving this injustice? And how can we as policymakers and organizations working very closely with policymakers, how can we do better? Like what is really needed for us to, to do better? Um, and I think the, the first thing that really comes to mind is um, time. I think often I see that there's good intention, but policy processes are not always designed to really factor in meaningful collaboration from the start. Um, and we need to be acting with urgency, but we also need to remember that collective action really takes time. Um, and this is the only way for us to have real impact and, and to have the transformation that we seek. Um, and it's absolutely worth the time investment. So I think, um, you know, really embedding this collaborative process um, from the start and throughout the, the project process or the policy process. So from really problem framing, from the research that is done initially um, to action selection, action definition, implementation uh, and monitoring and evaluation as, as was mentioned. And I think that um, where the tokenism comes in is when it's a once-off consultation, usually towards the end of the process. And that is something that we really need to, to move against. Um, 
and and then I have other reflections around some of the other barriers from a from a policy perspective, but I don't want to take on too much of time. So let me hand back to you and I'm happy to come in later. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, hopefully some of the questions will, uh, will allow you to uh, bring, bring them up. But back to you again is that uh, in the work that you are doing with um, uh, um, Seaforth and, and, and the cities, how are youth and women contributing to climate actions of the cities you work with? Is the engagement meaningful based on what you heard, particularly from the youth saying they want meaningful engagement? Has that engagement been uh, meaningful? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, if if youth and women are not contributing, how can they start to do that and to, uh, start engaging cities in their climate actions? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question, thank you. So as C40, we're a leadership group, so we don't have membership fees. To be part of C40, cities need to um, really show that they are climate leaders and we have requirements um, that speak to the level of ambition but also that speak to the to the inclusive processes that they take so this is something that's very central to everything that we do we have a dedicated team that works specifically on this um, with members you know situated across across the globe supporting this work and I think for us, it's really, you know, important, like I was saying, that every single stage of the process um, is, is designed to be inclusive. Um, I think that we have some, you know, great examples of where this has been done well, from Johannesburg to Nairobi, Addis Ababa, Lagos. Um, but I think there's definitely room for improvement. I'm not going to say that, you know, it's it's being done perfectly. I think that, um, you know, there's there's always going to be a greater reach needed. I think um, I would, I think that you know every effort has been made to ensure that, for example, the climate action planning processes have been um, have included wide stakeholder engagement um, uh, throughout the process. And as we now look towards implementation, a very similar approach is being taken. Um, but that is not to say that there is, you know, indeed greater need um, to to support the implementation of the climate action plans. Um, and bring in the voices of, of youth and uh, women uh, and other marginalized communities um, throughout the, throughout that process. Uh, thanks. You, you have touched on implementation of the action plans just, and you're saying that the, uh, the process is just beginning now. And how, how are you seeing in involvement of, of youth and women in, in, in that process? Mm. Yes. Um, so. So what we've been doing is as an initial stage from moving towards implementation, we've been developing um, gaps and needs assessments. So that's really to identify what it will take to develop the roadmap for implementation. And from the very start in all of our cities that we're doing this climate action implementation work, we're working with civil society organizations, um, youth groups, we're working with um, um, yeah, a very a, a range of, of stakeholders and really sending out invites very widely to ensure that from, from project inception, we're including um, broader stakeholder perspectives. Um, and then as the process unfolds, I think we're really very much focused on ensuring that the design and the benefits that that are um, not only the benefits, but also the burdens, that we ensure that we are really analyzing those actions. Um, so for example, in, um, communities, in some communities, we're rolling out re renewable energy and we really want to understand um, from, with the lens of intersectionality, what the impacts of energy poverty are on dis different groups and how we can include different groups in the process. So, um, I mean, I think implementation of the climate action plans is live. Uh, we're supporting some of the work and other organizations are supporting um, other aspects and the cities are of course driving um, a large part of those action plans themselves as well. Um, but throughout the process, we're really you know, encouraging and supporting cities to engage meaningfully um, and, to, and to, to really look at what impacts an action might have, how those, how those benefits and those burdens might be distributed, how you mitigate that, um, and, and to ask for the feedback, because I think ultimately that's how we can test whether what we're doing is, is good enough. Um, I think, you know, you mentioned earlier, 
like how can we is it is it really good enough what we're doing and I think the feedback that we've been receiving has been positive but um you know I think this 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 process is long and, and ongoing and I really liked how the YCC had framed this you know we're starting the, a, an ongoing conversation so it's really not possible to say that you know we're going to do this once off and it's going to be done and I think that's also um, a, cre a key principle that we need to follow that you know really continuous engagement. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, Nadia. Um, um, over to you Kwezi. So the PCC has been engaging with youth and women in, in the stakeholder engagements that you have been uh, carrying out in the past year or, or, or two, um, probably more visible than any other state organization um, that you have seen. So has, from what you have heard also from the women and their calls to action, has that engagement been meaningful based on what you heard and, and what can you share with other organizations who want to start engaging with young people and women? Yeah. Um, thank you, Klingewe. So yeah, definitely, I think um, the engagements with the youth have been very fruitful for the commission. Um, so when we do sort of um, hold the stakeholder consultations and we socialize different partners um, on different things that the commission is doing, we try to view the youth as an equal social partner. Um, so um, we do not um, we do not think that they have a smaller voice compared to everyone else. We do take into cognizant everything that the youth does tell us. And as far as um, advice to other um, policymakers or other councils and how we've done it as the PCC is that we, we, firstly we don't um, we don't think that we've done it 100% correctly because we are constantly being taught by you guys how we need to improve. Um, but I do think that as the the PCC we the youth in the PCC in particular, we are also quite lucky to sort of be under the leadership of people that actually really do believe in youth. Um, so, I mean, you see this even in the secretariat, you see this in the commission um, that there is youth representation and we do hope to still increase that. And um, every action every action that we do um, is sort of like an endeavor to always include youth. And some of the things that the PCC has done and that we can use to advise other um, um, councils on how they can engage youth is that the PCC is also looking at sort of having youth representation in some of our working groups. That's something we've been talking about coming out of the, of the conversations that we've had with youth in the past. Um, we're also looking at um, sort of having like a, a youth caucus before the actual commission meetings because the youth has raised the fact that when they get to these commission meetings, you know, it can be a bit um, daunting and overwhelming because, you know, it's a lot of jargon, it's a lot of um, policy speak, it's a lot of, you know, big people in the room. So um, that caucus is to basically ensure that the youth is um, enabled and empowered to actually go into those meetings feeling like they can have a voice. Um, that they don't feel sort of like overpowered by like, you know, um, the representation that sits in that um, commission, like your ministers and stuff. So we continue to do, um, take into account um, all the advice that we get from youth on an ongoing basis. Um, we are looking also to just empower um, our um, commissioners and the youth has also raised that they would like more representation in the commission, which is also something that the secretariat is looking at. So we're constantly learning um, and it's an ongoing conversation conversation um, but you know the dialogue is open between the PCC and the youth and we just hope that um, other councils can sort of like look to this and see and maybe we can share learnings of how we've done it and how we plan on improving what we've done to ensure that the youth is always heard. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much and then just to follow up um, what are what are some of the approaches that have been most successful and what have been some of the challenges you have experienced in the uh, in enabling effective uh, participation of of, of youth and women. Okay, um, so in terms of challenges, let me start with the challenges. Um, I think something that was pointed out from our side was that, you know, I think someone mentioned, uh, I think it was you who talked about how, you know, the youth comes from different backgrounds. Um, you know, there's division in sort of like the age, um, what people are doing, their backgrounds, their actual environments and their context. So there is a lack of, um, 
the youth being homogenous, sort of like um, it's hard to mobilize people that come from different areas. So um, some of the challenges that we've found is that as much as we try to engage youth, we might be leaving people behind because not everyone is represented by the people that have access to us um, and have access to the things that we do. Um, so uh, it's just a matter of trying to um, find sort of like a stable sort of body. I, I think we spoke about a, a council. One of the papers had a suggestion that that the youth needs to sort of come up with um, a youth council that will be a representative of sort of like all youth. Um, so we're hoping for something like that because that has been quite a challenge for us where um, as much as we'll have access to different unions or different ages, but we're not so inclusive of everyone because it's very hard to do that. So if we could find something like that and some of the approaches that we've taken on um, as, the, as the PCC, is that, like I mentioned, that as we socialize different stakeholders or social groups, um, whenever we have a piece of work out or whenever we're trying to get feedback from, from society at large, is that we treat youth as a, an equal stakeholder. So if we're conducting um, two consultations for government or whatever other social body or business, then we'll do the same for youth. Um, whatever issues that um, the youth does raise within our consultations, we ensure that for those, those issues do form part um, of our recommendations that we, we do eventually make. So um, I think that's just some of the approaches and also just involvement, you know, in stuff that the youth is doing, um, trying to sort of like um, rope the youth into like the PCC um, things or programs that we're doing. So um, essentially just it's trying to, you know, keep abreast of um, what the youth is doing, how we can be involved and sort of having an open door policy to the youth to say that if you guys do have um, things that you think that PCC might be able to assist you in, um, we will listen to it, you know, and if it falls within um, the bounds of what we can do, then the, the PCC will offer support in that sense. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, just um, um, to Kaisha and Wongengile, um, do you guys have any responses or that you'd like to share um, based on what you have heard so far? Okay, go ahead, Kaisha and then Wongengile. So yes, let us have the conversation. I love how you say that the PCC is ready, is willing, and is available to listen. <clears throat> Sorry. Whatever the solution that young people have regarding your climate um, action. So can you please tell us, um, because I part of the calls that we made as young people is that we are advocating for the establishment, establishment of youth councils. You mentioned that there's some sort of youth caucus that's in the pipeline. So can you please just um, give us a brief in terms of what that is and to what extent are young people going to be involved into that program and what impact will that have? Because we do not want a table where we're going to lay ideas and then it's gonna end there. Let's speak about further. What's going to happen, the solutions that we develop there. Where are they going and to what extent are they going to be taken seriously? Um, thank you for that question. Um, so I spoke about a youth caucus. So this is um, stemming from a conversation that the PCC had um, with the youth that is has been involved in the activities of the PCC. So essentially, when we have um, things like your commission meetings or whatever other events that the PCC um, does hold, they will be in part a youth uh, representation in those meetings. So what came out of um, our discussion with them and about how we can sort of empower them and capacitate them to ensure that they're able to participate in a way that is meaningful to them in those meetings is that they felt like, you know, it was a bit of an overwhelming environment. So the PCC and the youth that sat um, decided on the fact that Prior to those big meetings, the commission meetings, um, they would we would have a youth caucus where we sit with the youth and we actually discuss the things that will be spoken about in that commission to ensure that the youth, by the time they go to that commission meeting, they have you know um, they are they they are 
well resourced, you know, um, to ask the right questions because in the commission meetings, you know, we the commission is full of different social partners. So you'll have ministers that sit on that meeting. There are business leaders that sit in that meeting. There are leaders from government, local government, civil society, all sorts of social partners. So for the youth to feel like they have the confidence for them to be able to raise their hands and ask questions in those meetings, that's what the caucus is for. And because in those meetings as well, we'll be, we'll be presenting the work that the PCC has been doing. So for them to hold us accountable and to hold all the different partners accountable, it's important for them to feel empowered um, and sort of like, I don't know, confident to be able to stand up and ask the, the right questions to the right people. So also just treat, um, teaching them like protocol of what is acceptable, you know, how, how can you approach, you know, a commission meeting because I think another fear that organizations have, especially like big organizations or organizations that work, you know, with government or whatever, is the fear that um, youth can be radical, you know, um, youth will speak when, you know, it's not okay to speak. So what we do or what we're hoping to do is to be able to teach them the protocol of how you approach um, a certain setting to ensure that your voice is heard, you know, and you're not just seeing as you know, just because you're a young person, you're being disruptive or you're, you, or you're not being progressive or what, or productive even. So that is just for us to just empower them and to ensure that um, they are well capacitated and have the confidence to, to approach, you know, those sort of settings. Uh, thanks, Chris, uh, for that. Uh, ju just to add to that, uh, that process of the caucus is in working. Um, the t um, terms of reference for that are being drafted, and the terms of reference are being drafted by youth, not by the PCC. Uh, I, I really need to not defend the PCC. Wangakile, uh, <laughs> uh, you, you also had a question? A statement? Yeah. Uh... Um, as as women eh, from from Caroline, uh, we we just had a a manifesto now with with you. Since we started this conversation, I've had nothing that is directed to women. I I I I I love what is happening. It's like honestly, but. You haven't tapped on anything that concerns women. Now, what is this conversation? Is it inclusive? I'm, I'm not sure. So um, maybe if at least you tell us as a PCC, since we paved the way for you guys, where do we go from here? Tell us something about this or something at least that I've presented to you. You, are we together? Yeah, and then uh, since you guys have um, are, are working on a youth council, which is progressive, we also have our own demands that we like you guys as the PCC to intervene in. So what are we saying on that? Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> So, um, so like I said, um, we are willing to listen. We have been listening. And I think these conversations or these dialogues that we continue having are sort of, uh, um, you know, an expression of that. Um, the reason why we are here as the PCC and listening right now is because we want to go back. And the reason why I am here specifically as a woman, a young woman of the PCC is to ensure that I can go back you know, and, and, and table the things that I've learned from today's dialogue. So it's important for me to, to hear, you know, um, the manifesto and it's important for me to be able to have these conversations with you so that I can communicate these things when I get back to the PCC. And um, you spoke about um, implementation. You spoke about um, things that needed to happen right now. So, um, and this is not to sort of like run away from accountability as the PCC, but I do need to clarify that the PCC is not an implementing body. So the DFFE and the DMRE and other bodies of government are the actual implementers of government work. What the PCC does is that we act as an advisory body to the president and the commission, right? Um, so all I can do, and it's not nothing, Right. Um, what we can do as the PCC is to ensure that 
as much as we have this jet framework and we are trying to be inclusive of youth and other people, maybe we have fallen short of being explicit about how we want to include women. And this is something now we need to start talking about and this is why we're here. To, to be able to go um, to be able to go there and say these are the needs of women this is how they see it working out and this is what they feel because you know we have been key or instrumental in trying to include youth but we have sort of forgotten to, to look at things in, in sort of like a gender lens. And I mean, this is ongoing work with the PCC. We are working with different um, units within the, the the secretariat to ensure that um, in all our work, you know, as it stems across across finance, um, adaptation and resilience, as well as mitigation, we are sort of like also holding a gender lens that is going to enable us to ensure that we hear the voices of women. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, back to you, Bongekile. Um, so. What in the in the course that you made, you're very clear about transparency and accountability. I think you mentioned it more uh, more than once uh, when, when you're speaking. Um, so, what does transparency and accountability uh, from your side look like in the context of what of the work you do, and what would it look like uh, uh, if what would it look like if it works successfully? Um, and then um, I will I will ask Kwezi and uh, Nadia to respond to to what um, um, Bongile says. Yeah, I will say it would be a clear vision of equity, not equality. Um, <clears throat> at this point, uh, we we have issues of unemployment as women. We have issues of water, we have environmental issues and, 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 right? And we as women in Carolina have engaged with those mining companies. We have engaged with the municipality. We have engaged with key people that uh, we know. And we are still experiencing those issues. Five years after, we still have new mining companies five years after, and the government comes into our community and says, okay, uh, this is what we want to implement as part of a change, but they are not looking at how we are affected. So when I speak of equity, not equality, what I'm saying is that at this point, men are far ahead from us as women in terms of development. So if we had to speak of uh, job opportunities, for example, um, most of the women will still need skills development. In most of um, post advertisement or job advertisement, they will tell you about experience. Hence, women, women do not have experience. How will I get the opportunity when I do not have experience when I'm economically oppressed? So at this point, we firstly need to equip women, right? With those skills so that they're able to be in those spaces and they're able to account for whatever work or whatever opportunity that they got. We are not speaking of deployment. We want, we, we, we're taking a feminist approach that, is, um, that includes women who are, are accountable for their own actions. Uh, thank you, Wangagile, for, uh, for that. Um, so, Nadia, just hearing what uh, Wangagile has said, um, what, uh, what, do, what do you think will, will, what will, what will it take to make what her demands, what she has said, um, uh, come to reality? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you both. Um, I think what's what's really important for me, and I really want to echo this, is. The issue around skills development because I think the the conversation around a just transition um, is is you know very it's very much you know taking place without um, us really going into the the nitty gritty of what it would take to deliver those jobs and to ensure that those jobs that are created are accessible to those who need it the most um, and so 
I actually find that, you know, what we have done through um, C40 and the green jobs research that we had published last year, we looked at um, specifically what jobs can be created by implementing the, the climate actions, the priority climate actions across various sectors. And then we looked at how those jobs would be distributed um, based on current patterns of accessibility, which would mean that, you know, we looked at race, we looked at youth, and we looked at gender. Um, and I think that that was kind of the first research of its kind in the country, really looking at how jobs might be distributed um, at a local government level. And I feel like there's a need for similar studies and perhaps studies in greater depth to really look at what are those jobs, what skills are required for those jobs, and what educational you know, needs and uh, training can be offered to really ensure that those jobs are accessible because often the conversation around just transition is centered around the quantity of jobs. It's not centered around who has access to those jobs, you know, I think, and also um, the quality of those jobs. So uh, when we talk about job decency and paying a living wage, the working conditions associated with that, the opportunities for, for um, upward mobility, the opportunities for uh, you know basic coverage such as medical insurance, um, childcare issues that matter to to women. I think those conversations around how these jobs are being uh, created and you know how how those job specs are being designed and and what those demands are around a just transition. I mean, I, I certainly you know echo what has been said. Um, and I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this space for us to better understand what the skills needs are and, and how we ensure that these jobs are accessible and how we monitor that these jobs are accessible because it's not good enough to you know, publish job stats um, and, and really um, you know, focus on the numbers without focusing on, on the equity and the job quality. Uh, thank you so much, Nadia. And Kwezi, uh, or your response on what you have heard and what, what you didn't tell um, to make that a reality. Yeah. Um, so we spoke about um, skills, um, jobs, opportunities, as well as equity. Um, I think at the center of when we speak about um, justice within the just transition for us, um, that speaks directly to equity. So we're not necessarily just concerned about, um, you know, the people that will be affected by the closure of mines, as in the people that work directly for the mines, but the people that are in the informal sector around the whole value chain. So the women that are selling food, you know, close to the mines, the, you know, the people that carry, you know, the informal economy surrounding, um, you know, the fossil fuel economy. So when we speak about um, the different types of justice within the PCC, we try to sort of highlight how, you know, we need contributions in all three. Um, so when we speak about um, restorative justice, procedural justice, um, and, um, and um, transformative justice, we, we want to include um, the whole element of equity. And then as far as um, skills and employment, um, there is extensive work being done by the PCC, one of our units that speaks directly to, um, you know, um, skills of the future, um, employment strategies, and how, you know, looking at um, what type of, you know, education is going to be required or training is going to be required for the, 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 the economy of the future. Um, and then just bringing it closer to home, I think as far as the PCC also is concerned, um, we are champions of um, inclusivity, especially, you know, women representation. It reflects in our commission. Um, the commission is made up of more than 60% of the commissioners are female. And it's the same with the secretariat, as well as our leadership, because it's easy to speak about representation and then um, just that's where it ends. But um, every leader of our working group within the PCC is female. So that's something we're very proud of. And that's something we, we try to champion. So like I said, we're constantly learning. We're constantly trying to get better. And um, I think um, these conversations just really help to sort of like facilitate that and to ensure that, um, you know, we keep on the right track. You know, we are kept honest and we appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, uh, for that. 
um, uh, both from you and, and, and Nadia. Um, to you, um, Kaisha, just a question. Um, why are youth calling for awareness and education and what, what, what needs to happen to truly realize sufficient awareness and, and ed education? What are the causes? That you, if we were to say uh, young people are truly capacitated and they've been provided awareness and education, what, what would it look like? Yeah. Okay, what would it look like in terms of um, awareness and, and education? Um, I personally believe that education is the key without a doubt. So education is the key that we can use to unlock as many doors as we can. You know, people need to be um, capacitated. They need to be educated in order to know, um, okay, these are the actions that we have to make, but how can we make the actions meaningful? How can we make sure that we're not only moving for the sake of moving, but we are making impactful actions in that moving along? So, and awareness is also very important because it can help in terms of your, your vulnerable communities or let me say the people at the marginals, you know, for them to join and have a seat at the table, they need to be aware of the issues, not only be aware, but also be educated in how to tackle those issues. So I think education and, and awareness is very important to young people. It can help liberate them because it can help them form the solutions going into the future. Because there's no way you can move if you're not informed, well-informed or educated about certain issues such as climate action, for example. Thank you. I thank you so much. Uh, Kwezi, any, uh, any responses to that and how, uh, I think we sort of already touched a little bit around how the PCC is, is, is trying to, um, uh, increase education and awareness with young people, but if there's anything else you'd like to, uh, to add to that. Uh, sure. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think just to echo what she said as well, that um, awareness and education is going to be very key, especially to the vulnerable communities, because, I mean, they can't protect themselves if they don't know what they're protecting themselves from. So we do um, hold this very closely. And I mean, I'm, I'm, like I said earlier, I'm very impressed by the fact that, you know, the youth is very, very, you know, um, zealous about, you know, what is happening around climate change. And uh, when I say youth, I mean, I speak for myself as well, you know, um, because I'm I, I'm just learning about climate change as well as everyone else. You know, I I, I, I didn't always know about it. Um, I know now I work for the PCC and whatever, and, you know, it's an information overload. But I mean, before that, I had to teach myself about what this thing is for me to, to, to be able to sort of like understand why there's a need for it. Um, so I'm, I'm, like I said, uh, we're very like supportive of that. We're very supportive of teaching the most vulnerable about what is needed, um, what needed for them to know. And as far as the support that they can get from government, because that's the only way, like you said, they're going to be liberated. Thank you so much. Uh, just to say, uh, uh, everyone here in the room and everyone online, this would be my last question that I pose, and then I'm going to open um, um, the Q and A to all of you to post questions. So, um, so it, please start preparing your questions. Um, just uh, over to you, an idea. But um, what what are your responses around the education and awareness of youth? But also, um, I touch on um, a, a little bit about some of the uh, support um, youth hubs and youth in, uh, youth uh, engagement networks and how possibly young people could get get involved in that. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Bear. Um, yes, absolutely. I think um, education and awareness features really prominently in all of our city's climate action plans. Um, and it's it's really, really uh, critical and it's work that we are supporting. Um, I think we've come out of a, a period of, of COVID, which has really, you know, challenged um, on the ground community education and awareness initiatives. Um, but I'm really happy that um, we're now um, kicking off activities. I think in August, we already have engagements planned in Soweto and Orange Farm, engaging directly with communities on, on climate change to raise awareness on both climate change and air quality. Um, and, to, and to hear the perspectives of um, how climate action can be localized um, and how, um, cities and organizations working with cities can support those initiatives. 
Um, and then in terms of how we're working um, with uh, youth and in particular, so we're we're working through Young Go uh, because they have con they have um, hubs, you know, in all of the cities that that we work with. So um, as a central point, we work with Young Go, but we have also worked with um, a range of other youth organizations, including Youth at Saia, who supported the um, youth component of the um, climate action plan for Johannesburg. I think that's the only climate action plan that really has a very dedicated uh, chapter and, and asks from the youth. Um, and I think, you know, very open to working with a wide range of, of organizations, just acknowledging that um, there is also, you know, a capacity strain on, on organizing and so if we can take on that strain and um and support coordination we'd be uh very happy to do that um i think what is quite challenging and and uh something that we would really need support with and this is why we're going into communities now and and particularly targeting um uh commun vulnerable communities is really around the fact that a lot of the engagement was taking place on Zoom and, um, you know, because we weren't able to 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 do in-person engagement. And that has meant that um, it has been difficult to really ensure that engagement and we're getting um, people from all walks of life and um, particularly in disadvantaged communities, because what tends to happen in online consultation is that um, we you know, are only able to attract people from more privileged backgrounds or those associated with, for example, universities. And that is a challenge. And I think, you know, very open to any advice um, that panelists may have on how we ensure that the reach is even greater. I think, you know, going in, into the communities, um, I'm, I'm hoping would be um, the, way to, the way to do it. But if there's other avenues and other platforms that um, would be recommended, we'd be very open to, to hearing that. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nadia. I think that definitely some recommendations, there were some recommendations that were shared yesterday about if you are going to want to hear from people who are marginalized, go to where they are. So if you're wanting to speak to people in Sasol, go to Sasol back like, and speak to them. Don't ask people who, to represent them in, in their voices, but I think they would definitely share in the room uh, uh, some of the recommendations. Um, so there's been a hand that has been up. So I have this thing, right? Um, when I see a hand, I almost feel like the person is putting their hand and they've been put in, uh, so Lenkos has been putting his hand up since we started the, uh, uh, the discussion. So I'll uh, allow the, the Lenkos to come in and share his uh, question. Uh, please go ahead, Kobo Lenkos. Okay, uh, while they allow him to speak, uh, uh, please give us a few seconds. There's a question from Kwanele uh, Godfrey. Uh, he's asking you, uh, Wangekilim, thank you guys for the wonderful, robust discussion. A question to the woman the presenter. I love how she frames her points around the just transition with GPV. A quick one, please. What's your take on the teenage pregnancy since Mbumalanga province has the highest number in the country? I feel like feminist and Feminists and everyone in our society are failing these young girls. Where, where are comprehensive sexual education to teach them being sexually responsive? Also, how, how intersectional is gender-based violence? Because it's only, it's not only about women. Women as women as yourself who are also young, which means you are also categorized as a woman and youth. We have LGBTI community and children, which are also groups with so many rights. Um, uh, Tobaki, like, are you, uh, can you come in now? Tobolenkos, I apologize. Okay, um, uh, please write your question if you are struggling, but, uh, in the meantime, for those online, you can raise your hands if you have a question, and then I'll also take hands here in the room while, uh, Wangagile, uh, um, uh, give her a response. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think it was two questions. Was one question? Yeah, it was two questions around uh, I love uh, gender uh, G GPV uh, around uh, teenage pregnancy as well. Yeah, and can you, can you repeat yeah. the teenage pregnancy? 
Okay. What's your take on the teenage pregnancy since Pumalang province is the highest number in the country? I feel like feminist and everyone now society are failing these young girls. Where are comprehensive sexual education to teach them being sexually responsible? Oh, it's, it's, it's a very good one. Because when you speak of teenagers, when, I, when we speak of teenagers, we speak of people that are actually in schools. I think the person asking these questions, this question should have said, don't you think the government is failing these teenagers? We have a curriculum in our schools. Is it teaching? Is it teaching young girls about the realities of our lives? I've been speaking, I've been speaking about gender-based violence and how it links to these mining companies. And every year, or rather every other year, a mining company is opening in our community. It comes with this man in the name of skills development, which are the ones that are contributing to gender-based violence in our community. This government suppresses women economically. As women, we cannot work. In this country, if you don't have money, you can't do anything. Where else do we go? Because we, can, we become dependent in our boyfriends or husbands and don't and don't. Our culture tells us to be submissive. It tells us that a woman shouldn't work. And why should I work? I should be dependent on my men. And my man should give me money. And when my man abuses me or rather raised me, and just because he's my boyfriend, when I go and report it, they tell me, I can't say my boyfriend abused me. So now the question is, don't you think the government is failing us? And no, feminists are not failing this country. Feminists are fighting for the betterness of everyone. Feminists are fighting for women to be in spaces of decision making. But the government is failing us as feminists. The government is failing the person asking me this question. The government is failing those young children. And what do they say as government telling us about contraceptives, telling us about all this, um, telling us about HIV and all this other organization that talks about HIV? What do they say about teenage pregnancy? Don't they think that using condoms is not effective if teenage pregnancy increases? It's a question for thought. Can we move? Okay, thank you. Um, anyone in the room who has a, que a question? Okay. Whoa, okay. I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll start with this, this row first, the, and then we'll go, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Renee Samtsweni, and I come from Carolina. I come from the organization called Womanla Community Development. This question is to the PCC. Salvona says, Unjani Mamaki, I not see a pillar, man. I hear you talk about jobs. We are not here for jobs because we know we're not going to get jobs. We want land. Every civil society has written a memorandum. And in that memorandum, we mentioned as women, Oguti, we want land. We want to build, we want to plant organic food that's going to stop us from having our fibroids. That's going to stop us from having our cysts. If we eat the food we plant, we have been to several types of training where they teach us on how to work in agroecology. How are we going to practice this if the government doesn't want to give us land as women? Morning. How are you? Um, to the PCC. Anyway, I'm Norman Dengosi from Umandla. Um, to the PCC, it's... Um, not to say I'm undermining you or what, but I feel as if you are here just to 
to brush us off in a way. How come PCC is going to sell us whatever that you guys are saying while they fail service delivery? You are at the office of the president, right? So everyone in that office is failing. So how is the PCC different? Secondly, when was the PCC established? Can I ask? Twenty twenty. Yeah. And okay, let me not go to Abu Cop twenty seven and all that. So in that space, as Bongigile was saying in your presentation, or you, you, you didn't mention anything about women, you only spoke about youth while you did listen to uh, the presentation from Caroline. I think you, you, you failed us as women in the room. Uh, you only spoke about youth. So, which means in the PCC, you don't speak about women. And again, the PCC have been doing um, um, consult, so-called consultation and you, 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 you are at the office of the secretariat. Haven't you had women speaking about their issues? While today you will come here and tell us that no, um, women are there, they are in the leadership. What about the women who don't know what are they going to eat now? What about the women in the mining um, communities? where they were removed by a mining company in their land. So, you know, I have so many questions, very harsh questions for you, but I, I feel as if uh, I should um, give others a chance to speak. Then now, lastly, I will speak about the funding. In fact, to sting mal. We are here because of money. We are here because of funding. And the PCC, because it paid them the agenda from the West, it has money. And 70% or most of Le Malile is spent on hotels, salaries, it doesn't go to the communities. If Italian or 2020, if PCC, Ngabe now you're not here to brush us off. You will be standing proud to say, we went to Carolina and we spoke to women who are affected by mining, who have been removed from their land. But you are here brushing us off. And the women who you are saying are representing women there are women who are privileged, are women who didn't drop up out of school because of the circumstances that we, we see as black women. So, hey, yeah. Uh, I'm so disappointed, Chair, because we, we also thought that uh, Department of Women and Disability will be here. But next time, please do invite them. Thank you. We, we did invite them. Uh, we, 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 I think we're still waiting for responses at the, uh, as, as we speak. So yeah, we'll try and, and get, yeah, we, we, in the future, we'll, we'll definitely try uh, harder. Uh, there was a hand at the back. Uh, if, if it's another question to, uh, to the PCC, I, I, I'm going to allow Kwesi to respond uh, before I take another question. So 
uh, is your question directed to the PCC? Okay. Uh, at the back was was the was your hand direct? Okay. Then can I you can pose your questions? But I I can. Uh, think there's no question at the back. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, Lankos, can you come in uh, now? Okay, uh, uh, while we sort it out, uh, I'll have Quizzy respond. Um, thank you, Sengiwe. There was a question on, I think the first question was around land. Um, and the need for land, which I think we can all agree um, that is a pressing issue. So the PCC, um, when we speak about justice, I, I, I spoke about the three types of justice that we refer to when we speak about justice, which is the procedural justice, um, the distributive justice, as well as the restorative justice. So when we speak about restorative justice, um, we are essentially speaking to the historical damages that are caused by um, you know, um, the mining companies against individuals, against communities, against women, against the environment. Um, and when we speak about addressing um, um, restorative justice, we are speaking about addressing the health and the environmental impacts um, of, 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 the, of the things that have been happening in those communities and especially addressing things like energy poverty um, towards women in particular and the rehabilitation of, degrade, of, of, of um, degraded land because of the fossil fuel economy. So um, it's not something that we, we, we haven't spoken about or we haven't thought about, but like what I said earlier, right, um, this is part of our recommendations, recommendations that we have already sent to the president that he has received um, and that he is pondering over. Um, we do not know what's going to come out of those recommendations, but um, what we can do is ensure that the president has the recommendations because this is what the people are saying. So um, there is another question that spoke about, um, you know, how what makes us different as the PCC, you know, um, there's all of these bodies and all of these departments. I think what makes us different as the PCC is the fact that, um, like I mentioned, we do not implement. What we do is interface people. So we interface people and socialize them to what science is saying, what research is saying, um, what the numbers are saying, and then get feedback from people for us to be able to take back to the president and say, this is what the people think about this framework, this science, this research, and these numbers. And then what the president ultimately does is he will make a decision based on what the science says, what the research says, what the numbers says, and what the people say, right? So we do not sit in the office of the president. Yes, we, the commission reports to the presidency, but that's made up of ministers and all sorts of people. We as the secretariat are the administrative body. So we actually do the research and the work on the ground with the people. And then we go back to those people and then they are the ones that will then interface the president and action whatever deliverables we have come up as as recommendations and then also um funding funding is a touchy issue you know um it's 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 you know there's a lot of ideas about what that entails what is out there the narrative about you spoke about the pcc having an agenda from the west um, I'm not sure um, what informs that um, sort of idea, but I mean, the ideas are out there, the narratives are out there. Um, but what I can tell you is that the, the PCC does not receive money from the West. You know, it does not receive money from, you know, whoever, um, some, some sailing body that no one knows about. Um, we we are not even involved in sort of like the agreements that um, are tabled between government and the West when it comes to 
all not even the West, but like all other countries or let me say international financial markets, we're not involved in that. What we can do or what we do do as the PCC is to advocate for the fact that, you know, we need grant um, funding. We need whatever funding that comes into the country goes through national treasury, like all other funds. It goes into the fiscus, how they decide to spend it. We can merely try to influence, but we cannot dictate um, how, you know, um, we filter down this money into communities, but we can make suggestions. We can make suggestions like what you've said as the women of Carolina, you want implement, you want to implement now, you want imp implementable steps into like projects about what happens next. This is what we try to do. This is why when we went to places like Komati to like study the landscape of how has this thing actually happened? I'm holding the people that did do whatever processes are, did, are, are done in all these communities. Are these processes just? Has the community been left in a way that is actually just? What can we do to ensure that the people that are responsible for whatever processes happened in whatever community are held accountable? And that is what the PCC continues to do. So um, I do hear the call for sort of like advice on how you know people can then um, access funding and I think that that's then something that we need to think about as the PCC that when we do interface communities, this is a question that's always going to come up. So perhaps we need to start finding answers on where the community can go when they do have ready projects. I mean, we are working on things as the PCC to ensure that you are financing um, you the, the just transition. We're working on a financing mechanism, but that's probably at a very large scale and also the access to that might be limited to you know criteria that smaller communities or more vulnerable people might not be able to reach so this is probably something that we need to take a, st a, a further look at and sort of like explore and see how we can sort of mitigate thank you thank you um so just because i'm uh, i am aware of time uh we have 20 minutes before we, we and th uh, there are three questions and then i'm gonna check those three questions and then i'm gonna check one question here, one question here, and one question there. And if we still have time, we we'll come back again. Um, so, uh, an idea if you can also help in, in responding to the first two. Um, so, how how best can you bridge the gap between women and youth working energy companies and fostering an inclusive educational program and project in raising awareness or advocacy for climate change justice? And the second one is how best can youth and women participate in economic and social development of their community without political affiliation? And I think this one is going to crazy again. Uh, what action strategies will the PCC take in addressing the waste management in Jobek CPT? Jobek, um, sorry, I, I lost the question. Uh, sorry, I, what happened? Oh, there. Uh, Jobek is beyond hazardous and harmful to the environment. What about the abandoned buildings? How best can the youth be part of the process in uh, gen gentrifying the city? So I'll start with Anadia and then come back to um, uh, Kwezi. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, so on the energy companies and really more broadly bringing in the private sector into these discussions, I think there are some avenues that we've been trying to use with organized business, but there's certainly a need to um, expand that reach. When it comes to, um, I think council, councils were mentioned earlier around youth councils and something that we've been really advocating for is localized just transition commissions where various groupings, including women, youth, and the private sector can really sit down and have a conversation around how to localize just transition planning. And I think that that could be a solution um, to really bring in various um, you know, value chains that are impacted and, and the private sectors that are uh, part of those. We've been piloting this in the city of Ikurileni as the first uh, local just transition commission. Um, and that work is ongoing and we'd be very happy to share the lessons that that emerge from that work. Um, but yeah, I, I think on the second question um, regarding engagement beyond political affiliation, um, I think there, there are the IDP processes, the integrated development planning processes that include uh, various engagements and those are 
formal engage um, formal opportunities to really be able to influence the budget of local government. And I think that those engagements, which are open to the public, offer um, a critical opportunity. But also beyond that, um, engaging, I think, even if you wish to be politically neutral, um, you know, there are still opportunities to engage with those um, uh, policymakers that are, have seats within the ward, you know, ward councillors, um, and you can still remain politically neutral, but put forward your put forward your views. I mean, that's why those those committees, those ward committees exist. But at the same time, I'm hearing from the audience that there is this feeling that um, the existing institutional arrangements are not um, effective enough and are not really offering the the opportunity. Um, to to raise concerns and to and to hear various voices, um, and I think I'd be interested to hear you know what 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 everyone else thinks about if the formal systems are you know if the IDP process is not working and if the ward councillor process is not working then how you know what other ways are civil is civil society organizing in a way that maybe you know um those of us who work at the interface of government and the nonprofit sectors might be able to to use different platforms to to engage thanks uh, thanks nadia um to, uh, to crazy so the, there was an additional question because pcc went to val and what i saw is a nice fancy place booked and with lunch on the on the cruise limited number of 60 people I fail to understand why can't this meeting, why can't this meeting to the location where every South African member, members of the community can attend and participate meaningfully? Um, so that, that's, uh, so I'll allow you to 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 uh, to respond to that. Then I'll I'll pose question, uh, I'll take questions in the room. Um. So sorry, what PCC went to the Val and what happened? The venue, it was at a fancy venue, limited to 60 people. Why can't you go to a, a venue where everyone can access it and not limit numbers? Um, <laughs> I'm facing um, Tommy saying because <laughs> I mean, she understands that stakeholder consultation process way more than I do. Uh, and my belief is that when we do have um, consultations, you know, they will be outreach into sort of like the community to invite community members. Um, and then subsequently, you know, we would secure a venue after determining how many people will be joining. So is there a mic that we can float to Ntabi saying, oh, I'll go. Okay. Because I think she needs to take this one. Sorry, guys, I just do finance. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Um, Tavi Singh Masinge, Senior Communications and Stakeholder Relations Specialist in the PCC. Um, the case of the VAL consultation, what happened in the VAL was a pre-consultation. So usually when we have our stakeholder consultations around the Just Transition Framework is that we will go into communities and um, set up meetings with community represent representatives and uh, local government. So that's the pre-consultation element of it. And the plan for the VAL was to have a maximum of 40 people attending the event. And what happened was the event became bloated because we invited certain people and then those people invited other people. Then we ended up with the number of 60. So usually what happens with um, consultations or pre-consultations is that uh, we normally have them at uh, community halls or community centers, uh, venues that are very accessible to community members. And if we fail to secure such a venue, uh, what we do is to go the extra mile of uh, organizing transport uh, for, for participants from the different communities. Uh, what has happened, um, lately is that uh, when organization, certain organizations hear that we will be hosting a consultation in a, in a certain area, we do get offered a venue. Uh, and this is something that happened last year when we went to Secunda. Um, and, I, and I see some of, some of the women who are present here, I've, I, I saw them in that consultation where we were, were offered a, a free venue. So Sometimes it's a it's a hundred percent free venue. Sometimes you know we're we're offered 
uh, a certain percentage. Uh, and that is that is exactly what happened in the Val. We we didn't pay full price for what seemed to be a very fancy venue, and when we do uh, go sourcing quotations for these community hall venue type uh, type of places, sometimes we don't get a response because we're mainly how we communicate with them is. Uh, due to the PFMA, you know, you can only send out a request via email to a certain service provider. You know, there are certain limitations as to how we can go about securing a venue. So when we don't get a response from them, then we move on to the next venue. And that's how we, we went about to, you know, getting the 60 uh, person uh, fancy venue where they even... <laughs> uh, they even gave the participants, uh, I think it was a, a boat cruise or something like that at the end of everything. And this is not something that was financed by us in any way. Um, but on the, the question uh, that arose on, on us being funded by the West and things like that, uh, what we try to do as the PCC is to communicate uh, the work that we do very openly. What we have is, is uh, our website and all the, the information on all the work that we do as the PCC is on our website, including our annual reports, which uh, have our annual financials. These will tell you where our funding comes from, mainly funding from government and uh, how we used that funding. Uh, so if you have any questions about you know, where the money for the PCC comes from and what it's being used for, uh, I strongly urge you to, to visit our website and, and you can get all that information there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and uh, So I'm not ignoring the people in the room, mostly because uh, I'm in uh, Tabiseng and, and Kwezi, hopefully we'll be staying beyond uh, the time so you guys can engage with them, whereas the people in line won't have the opportunity to engage with them once we end uh, at 12. So just to, re uh, to respond to one question uh, that was posed, and I think, I'm not sure if Kwezi can respond, it, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like Nadia might be best place to, 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 res uh, to respond to this. What action or strategies will the PCC take in addressing the waste management in job CBD? Job is beyond hazardous and harmful to the environment. What about the abandoned buildings? How best can youth be part of the process of uh, gentrifying the city? So I, I don't know if Nadia, you think you can respond to that a little bit to some of the work that the support has been doing. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Lingibe. So when it comes to waste, um, we've really identified that waste is a, um, a priority sector for, for implementation. And the reason for that is that the mandate for waste sits with local government. So whereas with energy, you know, there's, there's some complexities and we are still working in the space of energy, but when it comes to waste, it really, you know, falls within the, the city's mandate. Um, and so what we're looking at specifically in Johannesburg, I see that's um, the, the city of interest, is around organic waste and diverting organic waste because a large amount of the, the waste um, that is ending up in landfill is organic in nature and um, can be utilized and, you know, um, in, in a better way. So we're looking at a project to collect organic waste, garden waste, waste from the markets, and um, looking at how that can be composted and how um, we could, would be able to produce like an organic fertilizer out of that that could then um, be used in food gardens and, and really to bolster efforts around um, addressing food poverty. And the, this project has um, really kicked off very recently. So I think perhaps the the best way um, Shlingiwe will be to also share the, the invites that we have for our external stakeholder engagement workshops with um, you, since you have um, contact to these networks. Um, but my colleague Kodani, um, uh, who you know very well, is um, really leading on the work in, in Johannesburg. And um, I think she has uh, similar networks having come from uh, to CPOTI from WWF. So um, I think as those engagements open up, we'll certainly share those invites and there will be opportunities to engage. Um, and then the other engagements that I mentioned um, are in Soweto and Orange Farm, the ones that are 
um, planned for August. And I think if there's any interest in attending those engagements, please feel free to reach out to me um, and we can share those invites. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to take a question. And again, the people in the room, they, uh, they are not going anywhere. So I'm just wanting to close up and then we can uh, uh, go. So I'll take Fanny, I will, I will take one hand here and then I'll take, um, there was, there's a big hand there at the back. Um, okay, I, I feel like I am not, I will take one here as well. And, then, and, and, we, uh, and those are the last questions and we'll, we'll close off. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I come from a former Bantustan, and it's actually something that most people are not talking about. I come from a town called Guadgua. There's nothing really special apart, about us apart from being a very cheap tourist attraction because of Golden Gate, you know? Um, so also, in addition to that, uh, back at home, ne, ESCOM can decide to cut off electricity for an entire week, and nobody strikes. So what does that say? It means that this has become habitual. So essentially, the reason why I'm here and the reason why I'm going to varsity, I'm trying to use my education to, I don't know, somehow come up with solutions and use the just energy transition to kind of empower these communities that are not affected by mining because everybody seems to be focusing on mining communities or communities with power stations. We don't have that. The only thing that we have was a textile industry. By the way, which because of these uh, ESCOM taking power for an entire week. These factories now, as I'm speaking, there's factories that are big, massive. They've all closed down. There are warehouses that are empty. And with that is families who are working there. People are suffering there. So now I'm asking you, you spoke about specifically the PCC. You said that you're going to be funding project, right? So I'm asking you right now, please tell me, what can I say to my people back home? How can we use those big warehouses that are empty? for these projects that you're saying that you're going to fund. So please tell me what type of projects you're going to fund so I can go back home and say, my people, this is what they're doing. And this is how we can become part of this just energy transition that must be just in terms of eradicating previous uh, results of, uh, of apartheid, you know? So yeah, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so my question is for <laughs> the PCC. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, I think crazy. Um, I'm fairly new to climate um, change uh, awareness, education, everything as well. So I'm passionate about it, but um, I'm, I'm very new. So I wanted to ask because the PCC stays catching hands. Every room that I've been in, this is probably the fourth, even at camp, people get very passionate and very aggressive to a point, which is understandable because these are pressing matters and people, these are their lived experiences, right? So um, for, this is a selfish question because I'm asking for myself so that I know uh, now that I have the opportunity to be in these rooms and to um, encounter certain people to ask the right questions, right? In regards to the PCC, um, I just want to understand so that next time we are in such a setup, I'm asking the right questions and raising them with the relevant people. Uh, in regards to um, education awareness. I think this question was posed before. What is meaningful engagement as well as, um, yeah, meaningful engagement with the youth and uh, with women look like for the PCC? And what does success, um, successful implementation of education and awareness look like holistically? So at the end of these conferences, these conversations, these vile bookings and boat rides and all of that, what does that look like? The takeaway, what is that? And um, I think it is important in terms of development and goals and timelines and so forth for us to have an understanding. Um, when I say us, I'm talking about uh, the PCC, other, um, the YCC, um, everyone, women, like everyone to have an understanding so that we are productive in asking and having meaningful conversation with the relevant people. So uh, in terms of your development goals, your timelines, um, 
that's what I, I want to understand. And um, obviously not the what I'd find on the website in terms of our values, our missions, just something that someone who doesn't come from a very um, knowledgeable background, someone who's very new to climate change, if I know I'm going to be encountering the PCC in future, what kind of questions am I able to ask and um, what kind of um, help I can get from you? And in closing, um, I think someone has said this already, but um, I think it's very important to focus on um, consultations and working with um, communities and people and stakeholders from grassroots level. I'm very passionate about that. Um, there's a video by Ernesto Ciroli uh, called Want to Help Someone um, Shut Up. So basically it, it talks about um, how an NGO from Italy went to um, a small village in Africa and they were trying to assist with um, uh, farming. So they were farming. Um, okay, uh, I'm getting <laughs> I'm getting the cut off, but I'll, I'll engage you further. But um, yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. It's 12 o'clock, just about to be 12 o'clock. Anyway, um, so I think from all the engagements here, we can all gather that this is a very, very nuanced conversation. And you get that from, you know, there's, there's localized interests, there's national interests, there's so many different variables to consider. And, you know, I empathize with the different stakeholders involved. Um, one of our facilitators from the YCC last year, Michelle, said something profound, and it resonates with me till this day. She said, the discussion of climate change is not a climate activism conversation. It's a social justice conversation because it touches on just about every um, facet of you know, society. And I think I'm concerned, and please bear with me, um, I'm concerned that in this conversation, and understandably so, given the history of South Africa, the world in the context of gender. But in the context of South Africa, it's a very interesting conversation in that there's almost parity as far as the ratio of men to women is concerned. We are almost at a 50-50, literally. I think I saw something that suggested that there's 97 men, 97 point something men to about 100 men are women in South Africa. So we're just about on equal standing, which makes it all the more viable for women to go we want equality, we want equity, and et cetera, right? But my concern is that as we have this conversation about climate change, the just energy transition, who is being cap capacitated, who is being taught, I'm going to be a man here, dudes are being left out of that conversation. Now, hear me out. Hear me out, dudes are being left out in the conversation. I had a conversation with one of the participants here yesterday and I said to him, I actually almost feel as though, or I'm of the opinion that women are more likely to be in tune with climate issues and have that basic understanding of what this is because they are on the ground and they interact with all aspects of the environment far more than men do. So I think if you go to a woman and go, oh, climate change is this and this and this, they're they, they are more likely to quickly grasp that concept compared to a guy who, men, men exist in very different worlds. They, you know, they don't really care. And I think in this conversation, again, the nuance is the men who are at the forefront of climate change are white men in academia and research. Black men are not at that forefront for the most part whether it's in academia or the most basic societal level. So if you go back home and you say to a dude, yo, climate change, this and this and this, they are going to dismiss you very quickly because their concern is, I want to look after my family. Now, I acknowledge that there's a bunch of terrible men who misuse, who don't understand that responsibility and who don't address it correctly. It's they don't understand the value of masculinity and its importance in sort of helping alleviate society and how it's supposed to function. But I want to know from Nadia and all the stakeholders here um, who can give an opinion on this, how do we go about having this conversation that we bring this hot-headed, rebellious, uninformed, 
gentlemen into the conversation so that they too can know what this conversation is about, understand what climate is, and understand how they too can be allies in this movement. I've been asking this question yesterday and I don't feel I'm quite getting the right responses because again, in the context of family, I think that there's the woman and there's her children. If there's a man involved in that, in, in that, in that structure and this man is informed, I think we can move a lot further if you have a responsible man who knows what this is and who goes to his family and goes, listen, there's climate change, there's environmental this and this and this. Let us practice responsible, sustainable living. In a family setting where a man is also saying that, that goes such a long way. So please just engage me on this and help me understand how we can also bring this demographic into the conversation as opposed to just limiting it to women and youth. And again, I understand why we are focusing on women and youth in particular, because I mean, it's written all over history. So please just engage me in that regard. Thank you. Sorry, uh, just to say Nadia ha has had to go because um, we technically meant to, to end at 12. Um, so she, she, she has left the, the, the discussion. But if people do want to get in touch with Nadia or have some, some recommendations to some of the questions that she, um, she posed, um, please uh, do send it, send it out to, to us and we will make sure that uh, it gets to her. Thanks. Okay, hello everyone. So. As a youth um, representative under Wumandla, I'm coming from an underdeveloped small town. So my question today is, how can you, or how are you assisting um, youths from underdeveloped areas um, to gain access to resources that they require to actually carry out um, whatever projects that they might be trying to start up with regards to educating the community about the just transition and climate change. And also, I don't know if, you, if you've read the manifesto, but the question regarding that is, um, what active solution do you have if you have read the manifesto? Okay, um, so I'm gonna uh, take responses. Do you, um, do you have any response to some of the questions? Bongele? Um, I can just, um, yeah. uh, you can respond then if Kasha has a response and then we'll uh, then end with a uh, question. Um, okay, so um, 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 because the other questions we, we, we direct I'm just gonna tap on uh, the question or rather the discussion or rather the comments about um, gender and so on and so on. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, see now, uh, in one of the engagement we had, um, there were men present, ne? and once we started um, the discussions on the two, like the master's house that I was talking about, they immediately exited the room. No one chased them out. This report is a feminist participatory research. It does not say we exclude men in spaces. It does not say we do not want men. I understand uh, what my uh, where my brother is coming from. But according to this research, all we want, our demands as women, is not to say, let's take this man out of spaces, but it's to say, we want to be in those spaces. We want to have those conversation and we want to have those meaningful conversation where women are also head and when it comes to a point or when we come to a position of implementation we also um a part of that end results yeah so just to tap on what my brother is saying i feel that it is a matter of 
men gathering themselves and actually discussing issues that are facing men first, before you can even say, how can we, all of us engage? Because if we speak about gender-based violence, as women, we have our own issues, right? And we see our own issues from our own point of view. And as men, you come from a different, um, also you see it from a different point of view because of culture and tradition and, and gender roles and don't and don't and don't. So if men cannot sit on their own and have their own discussions, they could never sit and have a discussion about climate change. So yeah, I think we should start there that uh, men should also have their own gatherings. Probably they can come up with their own manifest and, <laughs> and also, um, yeah, have those engagement. Thank you. Yeah, that was good. Okay, so I'm going to give a quick comment, basically around uh, marginalization. I could say, young person, I hear you. Woman, I hear you. Men, I hear you. Your concerns are also valid. This boils down to the idea of we are here because, as young people, we are here because we feel that we are not heard. Women, you feel that you're not included. You feel like your ideas are not really taken, you know, as seriously as they're supposed to. So it goes back to you then. What happens during the meaningful stakeholder engagements? Not just engagement with the youth, but how meaningful does that go? To what extent? Thank you. Um, I think just to build on um, to the meaningful engagement, um, so I think as the PCC um, and someone pointed out that we're always catching fire and I mean we have put ourselves in this um, position because we do show up you know when we are asked to be a part of the conversation we will take the fire you know so I mean um, what I'm trying to say is that um, all we want to see happen is us getting to a position where we the youth can look at the PCC women can look at the PCC and see it as a body that is representative of itself you know um, we want you to see our recommendations that we make to whatever stakeholders as representative of what you guys want so um, it we do um, understand that when we come sort of to these platforms and, you know, we're asked about funding and what what actionable solutions we have, you know, we might not have something concrete at the time, but we will be there to say that to you guys. So um, we're not going to run away. We will continue having these conversations. Um, and then someone asked, um, what, what does it look like? What is the success of a meaningful um, stakeholder um, a consultation look like? Or um, let me just read, meaningful engagement look like? In terms of education and, and awareness, what does the success of this look like? And I think um, just to echo what I said, um, I think it's important for us to feel like um, it's important for us as the PCC um, that when we do go to the commission meetings and when we do interface the president, um, the the youth feels like their voices are heard. Um, it's important for us when you read through our content because most of the issues that are being raised today, and I think this is something that our vice chair of the commission constantly says about the youth, right? Um, the youth says they want to get involved. The youth says they want to be they want to be heard. The youth says they want power. They want to take over positions and lead the country. But um, they didn't have to wait. And I mean, these are people that, you know, had to like overthrow the apartheid government, you know. So they didn't have to wait to be given power. They took up space, you know. They went into those rooms and they started making their demands known. And I feel like this is what is needed from, this is what a successful engagement looks like for us as, as the PCC, is that we want youth to be represented in every room that we're in. We want youth to have the confidence to speak to the issues that you guys are speaking about about now, but also we want youth to sort of be cohesive in, in their approach and in their needs. We want sort of like a unified voice that says, this is what the youth wants. This is how we're going to get there. And this is the type of support that we need. Because I feel like 
we keep having the same conversations about, you know, um, what about this community? What about that community? And we need to be careful of sort of like letting go of opportunities to sort of like have a unified voice because what we cannot do is be you know have all of this fragmentation where this particular person wants this thing and this particular person how can we effect change at a, like a policy level so we're, we spoke about different communities that do not come from necessarily um that are not affected by coal uh, mine closures but what can those communities do so the pcc is actually in a process of studying um different community owned models you know to address things like energy security energy poverty we are studying social ownership models to ensure that you know within certain communities um maybe a stock fell here or a church here is able to generate its own power how can they make money from that thing but also essentially what we cannot do as the pcc is sort of target each community one by one so we need an implementable solution that is going to be scalable throughout all um communities in south africa that are vulnerable that have um that will encounter the most impact from you know the transition so we are doing the work but also we need suggestions from the youth we can't every time we have to interface the youth be now you know overwhelmed or scared or intimidated because we feel like we can't answer your questions because we're going to get asked, where is the funding? We don't have funding. And if you understand the architecture or the structure of the PCC, then you understand what the PCC does. So there are just certain questions that we cannot answer. I think there's a gentleman that spoke to the fact that this conversation around climate change is a very nuanced one. There's a, there's a lot of stakeholders that play different parts and that play different roles within the chat. And if the youth really wants to have an impact within this sector, then they need to understand who does what. Where can I go for certain answers? Where can I go with certain questions? And I feel like this is, you know, um, how you know we will be able to make impact. Thank you. Um, just to close off, um, uh, thank you so much. You guys have been a wonderful crowd. Um, I hope that your answers, uh, your questions were adequately answered. If you do have any further questions, I will be sticking around for maybe 20, 30 minutes just to um, have conversations around, um, yeah, youth issues and women issues. Um, yeah, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so in closing, on behalf of young people, um, I think it was a privilege for me to be part of the Youth Climate Champions. I was privileged to be able to be in a space where I gain knowledge. And I thank um, CAAP for that. It really worked well. I'm saying that many other young people, uh, I was privileged to be part of this program. And I can confidently say today that the program is open again for a group uh, for the 2023 cohort. And I would advise young people to really, uh, uh, to really uh, look out for this opportunity is already open. They should really apply. That platform is huge. It can help you know how to stand. I think I was just drifting in the air, but through the project, I was able to find my feet and in terms of climate action and what to do in the future. So I think young people should really be out there. Uh, they should look out for such opportunities and really be involved and be willing and ready to learn. Thank you. Okay, um, <clears throat> just in closing, um, I am really worried about um, the conversation we had because as much as you keep saying that meaningful conversation is about, it also involves you taking a stand, doing something first. In front of you, you have report research, but you haven't said anything meaningful to it as part of the PCC. We understand you do not implement it, but what are you going to do with the manifesto or rather the information we have given you? I am going back home and none of these ladies that I came with have something to say or something to report to, to the women that are looking um, at us as leaders, as people who came here to, to get something and take back home. I'm really much worried about that. And I hope that 
when you read through that uh, report research, you will realize that actually women back home are struggling. And we are waiting and we are still waiting. And since we have started something for us, what we're waiting for is for you to come back and say, in this demand that you have uh, put on the table, this is how far we can go with you. This is what the president said, or we reported in this department, in this minister, however the case may be, but this is what they have said they can do for you. Um, please do that for us. As from a black woman to another black woman, please do that for us. Aha. Uh -huh. So now I'm campaigning for president. Yes, Lal. Um, but also in, in, in closing, thank you everyone. And thank you so much for showing interest in this report. Thank you for understanding us. Thank you for allowing us to, to speak in our language, to be free in front of you. It means that, see, I understand that, I know whether you youth, you are a woman, but we're all facing the same problems one way or the other. I'm grateful for this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I, I do realize that there, there are a lot of questions that are still not answered. So I am hoping that, uh, uh, but I do have to let people online go because they, we have gone above the time that you allocated for this webinar. So thank you so much to Kwezi. Thank you so, so much to Nadia. Thank you to Bongagil and thank you to uh, Kaisha for joining us today in, in, this, in this discussion. I, I, I've really enjoyed it. Um, I've really enjoyed the lovely discussions around how we can really start to have young people and, and, and women in, in, in these spaces and having their concerns um, uh, responded to. Uh, but I, I would like to suggest that if there are any th things that people want to take forward, please do get uh, um, uh, share them with us and then we'll see how we can take this forward because I do think this discussion uh, can't end here today. They, they, they still need more discussions around this. And lastly, uh, the, she mentioned the U, U, uh, the U Climate Champions Bootcamp call. I, I have to say, sadly, it, it closed last week, Friday. And when it closed, it had about eight, over 800 applications, and we still don't. So when people say talk about funding, in fact, we need more funding to hold more, more bootcamps. Uh, but yeah, so uh, hopefully, but there are other ways that we continue to capacitate young people. So that, please do uh, continue to get in touch with us because we are trying to ensure that we capacitate young people in various ways, especially ensuring that young people's voices are heard at, at policy levels. Um, so I apologize, I did not mention women because this is particularly around youth. Uh, but, but I think Humanza is doing a good job in holding that. And it, it, I will also share Humanza's contact details so that if people want to continue to engage with you, they, uh, they can send you uh, their, their, their questions and comments as well. Thank you so much, everyone online who has stayed up until now. Uh, it, it really has been a great honor and a pleasure to, to be able to facilitate this, uh, this um, discussion. Thank you.